in my husband's testimony, he says, you know, winning a World Series was awesome, but the best day of my year in 2004 was the day that my family was baptized. Have you ever allowed a sense of failure to keep you away from God? Have you ever been a bit discouraged and allowed your thought life to become your biggest bully? You can find peace and purpose, my friend. And today's guest, Billy Jouse, is going to help you significantly. I'm Carol McLeod. Welcome to the Significant Women Podcast. As I said, my guest today is Billy Jouse. She and I met a couple years ago at a speaker and writers conference, and we just loved our time together. She's an author, a podcaster, and speaker who wants to help us claim confidence and find fulfillment not by adding more things to our daily to-do list, but by realizing God's best things are already at work in our lives. I can't wait for you to hear Billy's backstory. Well, I'm with my friend Billy today. And listen, we really are friends. I mean, so often I talk to people, but Billy and I like each other a lot. (laughs) We have fun together. And honestly, Billy, I have to tell you this. The first time I met you and you sort of told me who you were and where you, like, I had sticker shock. I was like, what? I am talking to a famous person like your husband. Well, your husband, I guess. It's your husband that I was in awe of. But tell tell us, your life revolves around, most of our lives revolve around shopping and chocolate and children, but your life revolves around baseball. Tell us about that. Yeah, baseball. How about that? I grew up in Eastern North Carolina and I loved baseball. My dad got sick when I was 12 and our farm, we started leasing out our farm. So I had nothing to do on Saturdays. So I'd go to the local ballpark and watch baseball. And then um, fast forward quite a few years and I meet this guy that's a college baseball coach. And I'm like, wow, he's cute. Maybe I'll, you know, maybe I will accept his, you know, offer for dinner. And um, now we've been married 35 years. This is our 36th season in professional baseball. He went from college baseball coaching to professional baseball coaching. And he's been with, oh my gosh, I think eight different organizations now. And right now he's working with the Washington Nationals. But I joke around that his quote unquote claim to fame was in 2021 when he threw in the home run derby during the All-Star game, All-Star week. Um, He threw in the home run derby to Pete Alonso and they won. So we have three boys. We've raised three boys in this crazy game. And uh, the boys and I would hashtag stud because 64 year old Dave Jouse wins the home run derby with Pete Alonzo. We're like, if you're 64 and can throw in a home run derby like that, you're a stud. So that's a crazy, crazy time. But that's what I say is his quote unquote claim to fame. And then so can we can we like officially say that your husband won the home run derby or is that stretching the truth? Well, when I talk to Pete Alonzo, I tell him Pete won the home run derby, but Pete goes, Jossie won the, the the media because the media went crazy on 64-year-old Dave Joust throwing in the home run derby. And having been in baseball that long, a lot of the media people already knew him. Um, so yeah, we tend, a lot of people tend to say Dave Joust won the home run derby. I say, still say Pete did it. Cause I got to keep my husband humble, you know, <laughs> but, but yeah, so we actually look at baseball as our mission field. God has put us in this incredible place with these incredible opportunities to glorify him. And we do that through loving others tremendously and helping guide and lead whoever it is towards Jesus, be that the best player on the team or the lady I go and get my water bottle from at the stadium, you know, on game nights or people working security or whoever it may be. That's just where God has put us. But, you know, Carol, I thought one day, one day I'm going to get out of baseball. I prayed for years that my boys, three boys, wouldn't go into baseball. And guess what? All three of them work in baseball. So all in different positions, but they're all in baseball. So I'm never getting out. I'm never getting out. (laughs) So that's a lot of testosterone surrounding you, Billy. It is. 
So are any of your boys married? Has God brought you any daughters-in-law yet? Our oldest is getting married next year in our backyard. We live on acreage in Southwest Florida. They're getting married in the off season because when you're in baseball, you only have three months of the year. If you want your family to be there, you only have three months of the year to get married, three and a half months. So they're getting married in December of 2024 and it's going to be in our backyard. And that'll be my first daughter-in-law. I already call in her my daughter. And our youngest has a girlfriend that is very serious. And I believe that that will um, progress pretty quickly. They've been together four years since college at NYU. And so we could probably maybe have two weddings the end of 2024. Who knows? We'll wait and see. And Billy, we are all going to be praying that the Lord gives you granddaughters and they go to ballet and they like (laughs) pink and sparkles and all the things. I tell my sons all the time, I'm like, I'm praying for all granddaughters. I pray every day. And they're like, mom, don't curse us that way. We want boys too. I'm like, no, this is a blessing. I want all girls. I want bows and the hair and pigtails and shiny shoes. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Billy, tell us your story. Were you raised in a Christian home? Have you known Jesus since an early age? You know, the funny thing is I have known Jesus since an early age, but it really wasn't so much it it living in my home. We went to church. We went to a pretty, um, I guess, a very traditional church. and, And we went every Sunday. We did things during the week with it. Um, But it was a pretty traditional church where we didn't read the Bible. We were told what the Bible said in church on Sundays. And I just, from an early age, we had women that worked in our home. And and I grew up on a big farm. So because so many moving parts, we had people that, that lived in our, or worked in our home, worked in our yard, worked on the farm. And there were some very godly women in those groups that, I learned a lot about love and the love of Jesus from. So I believed in Jesus. I knew who he was, but it wasn't until I was a teenager and my family home was a little chaotic at times and my dad had gotten sick and and things were different. We weren't farming the farm anymore. Like I said before, when I started going to baseball games and when I got my driver's license, I started going to church with friends at much more Pentecostal churches that I was not used to. But boy, was my heart opened up to who Jesus was and all that he wanted me to be with him. And um, one Sunday night, I gave my life to the Lord. And the there were a lot of people there that I knew growing up in a small town. And they said, go home and tell your family because you're going to be a light of Jesus to them. And so I went home, told my family, and I had a couple of family members laugh at me and say, don't you know God can't love girls like you? Mm. Thanks a lot, people. Like, really? So being 16, I was still impressionable. I'm like, well, I guess I am that bad. I'm not a good girl, so I can't, Jesus can't love me because I'm not a good girl. And so I lived a pretty crazy life after that, making poor decisions, met my husband. We both knew who God was, who knew who Jesus was, but we didn't know how to walk that out. And we got married in the church that I grew up in, had a very Christian ceremony, um, started going to church as we started having kids. Of course, many of us do. Went back to that very traditional church because that was what I knew. And uh, it got to a point in one of the cities we were living in where the pastor of the church, the priest of the church, um, actually was a female. And she came to me and she said, Billy, you have such a heart for Jesus that you need to go to a church where you're going to learn more about the Bible. And I thought that was so grace filled of her. That was so freeing to me that I was serving, I was working, I was doing to please God. And she knew that wasn't where I needed to be. She knew I needed to be where I could learn more about Jesus in his word and in discipleship of others that were on that same path. And that's when uh, I decided to go to a different church. David and I had had some really hard marital years during that time. And I was really seeking who I was and what I was and where my life was going. And I found that 
with Jesus in a, a non-denominational church and, and um, started studying the Bible with a couple of women there and fell in love with Jesus wholeheartedly and committed my entire life to him. In that, David and I started working on our marriage. He, David saw a change in me. He asked me, oh, gives me a little teary-eyed, but he asked me, he goes, you're different. I want to know what's different about you. And I said, well, I've been going to church because with our husbands being in baseball, our husbands aren't with us on Sundays. We yeah. don't see our husbands a lot of the summer, half of the time, if we're even in the same town with them. And so he didn't even know we had been going. He, he knew we were going to church. He just didn't know we had changed churches. And so he saw a difference in me. I was I was different because I was ple- trying. I, I was living my life in a grace-filled, loving way that was pleasing to God, not to please God, but pleasing to God. And he saw that and he wanted to know more about it. And then the end of that year, um, we actually were with a team that won the World Series. We were with the Boston Red Sox and they won the World Series in 2004 after an 86-year drought. And that December, my whole family was baptized in this church that we were attending. And in my husband's testimony, he says, you know, winning a World Series was awesome, but the best day of my year in 2004 was the day that my family was baptized. So, Billy, you you said you were not a good girl. You said you struggled during your teen years and even after you accepted Jesus. Um, what would you say to a woman who's struggling with past sin? Like, like did you have to forgive yourself? What What did you go through during those years, especially when you really came back to Jesus? Yeah. You know, I always go back to doubt of self because I was so caught up in me, me, me. Um, what ifs that were all related to me? Why nots? Because they were all related to me. Why? Because it was all related to me. And when I went from questioning um, God's ability to more of questioning, not, not questioning his ability, but relying on his ability. What, who do I know that God is? Because if I know that God is the beginning and the end, that he is with me at all times, that he is overseeing everything that goes on in my life, then that takes the pressure off of me trying to be a good girl, trying to be, you know, because if God is who he says he is, and I truly believe that he has called me, and this is where a lot of people get stuck. Well, what did he call me for? He called you to glorify him. So what are you going to do about it? So in that, if I'm striving to be a daughter of the high almighty king, I'm striving to glorify him more. And how do I do that? Because I don't know about you, but have you ever read the Bible? You're like, okay, what does this mean for me? What is this about me? Me, 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 me. When all of a sudden you start looking at who is God? Yeah. Who is he and who has he created me to be? And that was the turning point for me. So let's go back to baseball for just a minute, Billy. And then we're going to talk about your newest book. But so you said that you and your husband, Dave, you now have turned baseball into a ministry. It's not just a profession. It's not just his love, but it's your platform of ministry. So tell us, do you minister to baseball wives and how do you do that? Yeah, uh, they're my girls. They are my girls. The thing about being with a baseball team is that I look at it as I have a ready-made family for eight months. They're my family. I'm going to spend more time with them than at this point with my children. I spend more time with the players and the wives, mostly the wives, then I do my own children. So I am a gatherer of people. I love gathering people and doing things together and traveling together. So in those moments of being that close to people for eight months a year, you grow a trust with them because I'm going to be who God's created me to be. I'm not going to beat them over the head with the Bible but I'm going to have a Bible study. I'm going to be inviting everybody there to a Bible study. When they ask me a question of, oh my gosh, how have you done this for 36 years? I repeat back with the first 10 were pretty horrible. 
but the last 26 have been amazing because I changed my focus. I joke around that in the beginning of baseball, I was the age of the wives and girlfriends. Yeah. I'm 36 years older. They're still between 22 and 31 years old. (laughs) It's like, they're usually not much older than that. Maybe a little younger at times, but I'm much older than that. So I went from being their peers with kids the same age to now being the age of their mothers. (laughs) So um, that has been a little bit of a change, but it's just this place of loving, of loving on them, you know, and you have so many times, oh, well, you're a good Christian and you, you're you not going to be my friend because I'm not a good girl or whatever they say to me. And I'm like, no, I love you. I love you just mm-hmm. like you are. And so does God. God love, And I, I, you, I talk with them about God and then talk to them about the intimacy of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that is just a place. It's, it's funny how you'll have girls say, oh, I don't believe in God. But then their husbands get on the mound and they're having a bad outing and they reach over and go pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you pray for him and I do it. And I, and when they ask me to pray, I pray out loud with them holding their hand I don't get into, well, you know, you can pray too, or, you know, I just live life with them. I, I, I love on them. I've helped girls get to the hospital to have babies. I've cleaned up hotel rooms from kids with stomach viruses. (laughs) I've, you know, I've, I've, I'm a baby stealer. I'll steal the babies away from them and let them have an hour or two by themselves. It just is a place where we, our mission is to love on them and show them the love of God. Oh, I just love that belly. Yeah, and I do uh, it with the players. I do it with the players too. So I'm a hugger. Yeah. So yeah. there are a lot of players that after games they're sort of grumpy, and you know if they didn't have a good game or whatever, and they walk out of the clubhouse and they'll see me, and I just open my arms and go, "Come on, come on, I need a hug. I need a hug." Yeah, and they'll yeah. grumpy over to you and hug you, and then you just feel their body release a little bit, oh, and my. it's just loving them. Just loving them. Just Mama Billy. Mama yeah. Billy at work. Yeah. I'm going to be Grandma Billy by the time we get out of this game. I'll be old enough to be a grandma to the players. <laughs> you will. You will. Well, we'll get back to Billy's story in just a minute, but I wanted to take some time to tell you a little bit about what Carol McLeod Ministries is doing behind the scenes. We are intent on fanning the flame of faith in the lives and hearts of people all across the world. We will not pause. We will not be silent. We will not stop in our mission to make hell smaller and heaven bigger. This year, we are praying about, we're intent on bringing my Bible study, Meanwhile, Meeting God in the Wait, to women's prisons all across America. In case you're not familiar with it, Meanwhile is a deep dive into the story of Joseph of the Old Testament, and Joseph spent time in prison. I can't imagine a better resource for women who are in the wait in our prison system. This study on the life of Joseph encourages women that God is turning their meanwhiles into miracles, that their stories are not over, and that God has a plan and a purpose for their lives, even while in prison. We long to donate at least a thousand copies of my book, Meanwhile, as well as the teaching downloads to prisons, as I said, all across America. This entire venture, Gulp, is going to cost us about $10,000. But if our mission is to make hell smaller and heaven bigger, Can you think of a better way I could do that? So this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray. I want you to pray that God would open the doors in the prison system for us. I want you to pray about maybe helping us with the cost um, because that's no small investment for us. However, there are other things you can do. You can recommend this podcast to a friend. You can buy one of my books as a gift. You can attend one of my in-person events throughout the year, or I'd love to come to your church and speak. All of those things help us make hell smaller and heaven bigger. It also might look like becoming a monthly donor to the ministry or just giving a one-time gift. I hope that you will join the Carol McLeod family as we serve the Lord diligently and intentionally. 
Listen, I can't do it without you. Y-O-U-U. You You can connect with me online, carolmccloudministries.com, or you can email me personally, carol at Ministries. Now, let's rejoin my conversation with the vibrant Billy Jouse. But now, Billy, I do want to talk. So you have this life as a wife and a mom, as a baseball wife, as a minister in the baseball world, but you are also an author and you've written two books. Book number three is coming out next year. Um, But I wanted to talk about your book titled Distraction Detox. What made you write this book, Billy? Distraction Detox. Yeah. So my first book was called Making Room. And that was a lot about the external distractions. And I got a hold of my external distractions. I simplified my schedule. I was taking time off of my phone. I was spending time doing other things. But I found that I was still a bit spiritually stagnant. There was just something that I wasn't deepening my faith in the way that I thought I would once I had those external distractions underhand, you know, like I had a hold on them and I, it worried me, you know, I'm, I, I worry a little bit about falling away from Jesus. I never want to fall away. I never want to backslide, you know, those words that people use when people aren't exactly what they should be. I never want to lose that connection with God, with Jesus. I I want to stay connected as much as possible. And I was concerned. I was foggy. I was lethargic. I was just not remembering his word at times that I needed. I was more worried and anxious. And I purposefully started digging into what was going on. And I got down to the point of, it's my negative thoughts. I have attended, my mother was the queen of worry. She would ask you, what are you worried about? And you say nothing. Well, you need to worry about something. So I was conditioned growing up to worry. Like that was just worry. Be, you know, be anxious about it. Get worried about it. And so I started digging into it. And it was a lot of negative thinking. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't belong. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. You know, going back to those words that were spoken. God can't love a girl like you. Mm -hmm. And so I got to a point that I knew it was my negative thoughts and I'm a list maker. So I literally sat down and made a list of all the negative thoughts I could think of. Like, what are the ones I go to? And then I kept a notebook with me for about a week and I kept writing down all the negative thoughts. And then one Sunday night, I was sitting by myself and I started looking over that list, Carol, and I was floored. I realized in that moment that I am my biggest bully. No one on earth speaks to me the way I speak to myself. No, I would speak to no one else on earth the way I speak to myself. And I knew it was a huge problem. And so I'm a planner. I have to have a target. I have to have a plan. I have to have steps, a process. What am I going to do? Because I prayed, Lord, heal me of these negative thoughts. But sometimes I believe the Lord truly wants us to walk through the valley so that we're more dependent on him. And so I started working on it. I started looking at it. What, you know, these are the toxins I have. I call them emotional toxins because they are poison in my system. What do I need to do? Well, I need to look at them and sort of figure out where they come from. How do they make me feel? Why am I holding on to them so tight? Why am I not walking away from them? And I went through that time of really feeling the feels. How does it make me feel? And I did one at a time. That's another thing that we can't, I couldn't tackle the whole list. I did one at a time. And I went through one at a time, feeling the feels, looking at it, digging it up. And this is when I say to people in the book, if you get to this point where you're digging into these toxins and you can't handle it, go seek counseling. There were a few I had to seek counseling over because they were much more harmful than I ever dreamed they would be. And they weren't on the top of my list. They were in that digging deep list. And I had to seek a counselor just to talk through it. A Christian counselor, she's been amazing helping me talk through some of them. But you dig them up. And then I go through in the book, I go through terminating the toxins. And that's taking a deception because all these negative thoughts are complete lies. 
They are lies from the enemy, not wanting you to grow closer to Jesus and do his work. And so terminating the toxins, you take the deception and you replace it with the truth. So Mm. in that process, I'm like, wow, this is, I just want to see if people are like me. Do they have these negative thoughts? Are they overwhelmed with thinking that, oh, wow, I'm really a bad mom. Oh, I'm a bad wife. I'm a, you know, and I went to my baseball girls because that's who I'm with the majority of the time. And I just ask them, I ask them, are you struggling with these things? And they're like, oh my gosh. And we started working it out together. And so that's where once I saw it was such a place of burden for a lot of women is when I decided I'm going to put a proposal together and see if this is something that could be put into a book. And that's where the book came from. But I went through the lessons first myself. I don't do anything. I don't write anything without having gone through it myself. Unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah, I know. If you want to suffer pain, be called to be an author because it's there. Let me tell you. Exactly. So tell, tell me specifically, Billy, what were some of your emotional distractions? So you've referenced worry. You referenced um, loosely self-esteem because you said you right. bullied yourself. Right. But what were some of the things? Because women can relate to this. What were some of the things that were the toxins yeah. inside of Billy? Yeah, one of the things that I was a little surprised about that kept coming up often was I don't belong. I don't belong here. I talk in the book about imposter syndrome because when I started writing, I don't belong here. I I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. I I don't even speak English well, no less write it. You know, like I had all these things about me that I'm like, I can't write a book, but I, I got my first book offer and my first book did really well but those were the things I was thinking was somebody's going to show up one day imposter syndrome somebody's going to show up and tell me I'm not good enough yeah yeah they're going to say your book is terrible they're going to tell you your podcast is horrible they're going to tell you you're an awful speaker no one ever did now you know online you get these people that say things every now and then but they don't count I'm talking people that count you know, the pastor of the church, the writing uh, instructor, the the podcast host that interviews you or listens or is on your uh, podcast, whatever it may be. I wasn't getting negative feedback from other people, but I was shrinking back yeah, because I was struggling so much with I don't belong here. I don't mm-hmm. belong at this ballpark because these women are better than me. These mm-hmm. women have more than me. And uh, Carol, I hope you know me. I am not a materialistic person. I will walk around a pair of jeans and a t-shirt all day with flip-flops. That is like, I am pretty simple. A lot of baseball wives are too. But, you know, comparatively speaking, our salaries aren't the same. My husband's not the same salary as the big time player. So there was some of that comparison, comparing myself to other people. And I'm not a people pleaser, but I started finding that I was changing things to fit in more. And those were uh, because of the emotional toxins. There were a lot of times in the, in the stands that I would pull out my phone and start scrolling social media because I felt lesser than the woman sitting next to me. And I wouldn't talk to her, not because of her, but because of me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I'm not allowing God to use me in the very place he's put me in the very time of my life that he's put me there with the exact outfit that I have on, the same pocketbook that I carry, whatever it may be, the same car that I drive, God has put me there. And so those emotional toxins, that's when I started seeing, oh man, because I think I don't belong, I'm separating myself from the wives. Because I don't think I'm smart enough, I'm, I'm questioning if I should lead a Bible study. After the book came out, I did an interview. Now, I'd written the book. I'd gone all through the process, you know, gone through the process, written the book. It had been published. It was it coming out. I did an interview with a man that was talking to me, and he's like, what's one negative thing you're, the thing you're thinking right now? And I said, I'm a bad mom. 
well, why are you thinking you're a bad mom right now? Well, I don't know. Like, I'm worried my kids aren't going to continue to be close to me as they get older and as they grow. And, you know, things are changing. People are graduating. My kids are graduating college. You know, my baby boy was still in college. You know, that kind of thing. And this was all new to me. No, I had thought in the past, oh, I'm a bad mom. I screamed at my kid. I'm a bad mom. I fed him nuggets for dinner instead of vegetables. Oh, I'm a bad mom. We stopped by McDonald's. Whatever it was, but it wasn't, I didn't think as deeply rooted. And after I got off that podcast interview, I went to my book and started reading through it with the lens of I'm a bad mom Mm. and dug into it and realized Mm. that in my mind, in my subconscious mind, it nailed, It really boiled down to an experience that I had with my oldest son when he was about 12 or 13 years old, where I reacted in fear of something he was telling me about his friends, and I screamed him into a corner, yelling at him. Uh, that was That's the type of mom I am. I'll never be better than that. Even though once I started digging into it, we, we asked for forgiveness from one another, he didn't even remember me doing it because I asked him. We had worked through it. My oldest son calls me almost every day. I had a TV interview this week. I'm on the stage getting ready to do the interview, and he called me. I hung up on him, put my, my phone on Do Not Disturb, and he called back because he was worried where I was. Now, this is the son that I'm determining I'm a bad mom, because if something happened when he was 12, which was 20 years ago, and I had to look at it and go, that's just a lie. Yeah. That is a, a complete lie that I'm a bad mom. Did I do some bad things? Yeah. Did I do some things that weren't great momming? Yeah. Did I fail a lot? Yeah. But I did pretty good with my boys. My boys are great men. They all have their own health care insurance. So thank you, Jesus. So that's success. There are some things I wish they were doing differently. There's some social things I don't agree with. You know, some are not going to church. Some are not following Jesus the way that I wish they were. But I did the best I could. I taught them about the Lord and I pray for them every day. And we have a good relationship. Mm. That doesn't always happen with moms, but it does not mean that you are a horrible mom. It That's means right. you can do better right. today and tomorrow. That's right. And so That's in right. that, I grew, even after writing this book, I had to go back to my own book and dig out what I needed to find. Well, the name of the book is Distraction Detox by my friend Billy Jouse, and I really hope you'll get it. If you, like Billy and like me and like most women, let's just face it, we tend to beat ourselves up internally. Yeah. We don't have Mm -hmm. bruises on our bodies, but the bruises are on our souls. Mm -hmm. Um, And my sisters, it shouldn't be this way because you've been made in the image of your creator. And his mercies are new every morning, Billy. Isn't that so wonderful to know? Um, So, Billy, you know, the name of my podcast is Significant Women Podcast. Um, What women have deeply impacted your life? Who are your role models? Who are your heroines in life? Oh my gosh, I want to be like you when I grow up, Carol. Stop. <laughs> Serious. I, when I met you, you know how you meet people and you're like, I just, there is this connection yeah. we have yeah. on a spiritual level. And it was right away, we didn't know that much about each other, but we connected on such a yeah. spiritual le- level. And I just, res- I think I respect what you do so much. And it, it's, it's as a, newcomer I feel like still I haven't been writing that long it's it's lovely to see women doing what you're doing at a much higher level my girl you are killing it on the higher level and I just love watching you so I thank you for being a significant woman in my life but also in others lives and you know of course there's always other people there was a teacher I had in high school that really shook me and and told me I needed to step out in a different path and then my sweet girlfriend, Ingrid, in Boston that sat down with me on her front porch and opened the Bible to John and said, do you believe this, this, and this? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, well, what's wrong then? What's the problem? I'm like, I don't know what to do after that. 
And she discipled me along with a group of other really great women. Um, another woman in baseball, Renette Manuel, her husband actually hired my husband. She has been one of my closest, sweetest Christian mentors throughout all these years. And I just think as long as we have our eyes open, looking for a woman, a significant woman in our lives, we can find her. Amen. Amen. So, Billy, I know you love the Bible like I do, but do you have a favorite Bible verse or a lifetime Bible verse that you just default to, you go to time after time? Yeah, Galatians 5.1 is one that, you know, has just stuck on my heart for a long time. And you're going to ask me to, to memorize it. And I'm not, I'm not going to know it right off the top of my head because I do know it because it is about freedom and not living under the yoke of slavery. And um, here it is. It's in the book. The, distri- the deception is I am stuck. Life will never get better than this. And it, the truth in that is Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Whatever that yoke of slavery is, if it's our thoughts, if it's our phones, if it's a bad relationship, we live in the freedom of Christ, not in that yoke of slavery. Amen. Amen. And that verse really reflects the truth of your book, Billy. Yeah. So I can yeah. so understand why that is your anchor verse, um, yes. because we all need it. Stand firm. Yes. The Bible says stand firm. Well, Billy, I just want to thank you for being a light for Jesus Christ in a very dark world, the the world of professional sports. Um, yeah. Thank you for shining the light of Jesus. What he has appointed to you is pretty significant, my friend, and you do it so well. So before we go, would you pray for my listeners today? Oh, yes. Thank you. I'd be honored. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you for each and every person that's listening today, Jesus, that I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come alive in them in a way that they've never thought it could, that they seek you first in all that they say, all that they do, all that they are. And that I pray, Lord, that in these burdens, in these yokes of slavery that we have in our lives, be it our negative thoughts or or anything else, Lord, that we can find freedom from that in you, that we can take those thoughts and release them, those deceptions and release them and find your truth in them. I thank you, Lord, as we step out each day, that one small step of faith toward where it is that you're calling us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've been encouraged by today's episode, would you reach out and let me know? You can email me, carol at carolmcleodministries.com, or you can connect with us on any one of our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And as always, don't forget to download the free app on your smartphone. Just go to your app store, do a search for Carol McLeod Ministries. I really want you to connect with Billy Jouse. You can connect with her on her website, Billy Jouse. Let me spell it for you. B-I-L-L-I-E-J-A-U-S-S dot com. Check out her latest book, Distraction Detox, which is available on her website and on Amazon.com. You know, every time I close an episode of the Significant Women podcast, I always know that my words or my guess words might fade away, but the word of God will never diminish. It can always leave a powerful impact in your life. So maybe close your eyes, just sit back and rest for a minute and listen to these words from the Bible. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they know me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that a beautiful promise? No one will snatch them out of my hand. Do you have trouble hearing your shepherd's voice? Do you need to remove some distractions so that you can hear him more clearly, fellowship with him more fully? I want to challenge you this week to earnestly spend time seeking his voice. Get on your knees, turn off the TV, put your smartphone in a different room and spend time with Jesus. 
open the Bible, lift your voice and song to Him. He's just waiting to commune with you. It's His favorite thing to do. I'll see you next time on the Significant Women Podcast.